Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, family, and welcome to the Mental House with me, your host, Khadija. Um, as y'all know, I haven't gotten much sleep last night, um, this morning, today. Um, um, we're still grieving over here. As y'all know, uh, from the from murder of my beloved brother. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to um, show you a picture of my brother and myself, my mom, and um, it's a picture that I hold very dear. Here it is. That's my mom, my brother, and myself. And as I share it with y'all, um, he's no longer here, you know. So we got to go on, and um, we still are getting information. And uh, it's probably going to be that way for a few days. And I'm just doing this video so I can have some sense of normalcy because although I'm, I'm totally aware that death is a part of life, that's my brother, somebody I've known all my life, somebody that um, although we fight like cats and dogs, I love him to death. And uh, this is very difficult for me. Very difficult. He was a brother that you could count on. He was a brother that uh, made sure everybody was okay. And that's his legacy to this family. Making sure everybody was okay. I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time today talking about that. But what I did want to show before I get into this next story, before I get into this story, I wanted to uh, share something with y'all that my godfather said. Um, if y'all can see him. This is the beloved James Cameron. Let you see it again. This is a program that the last program that uh, we put on for him while he was alive. Uh, we try to give people their flowers when they're alive. He was born in Marion, Indiana, uh, and he ended up here in Milwaukee. Uh, so this is where he's been living for a few decades. Um, but one thing, and this was sponsored by the Black Holocaust Society, of course, that's us. Uh, but, uh, Wisconsin's, um, uh, own surviving son, um, uh, he's a, the only known lynching survival, that very famous picture that you see, um, and there's these brothers hanging from the, the the nooses, and then there's one noose that's not. Well, that was the one that was laid aside for Cameron. He was supposed to been in that picture, uh, but he managed to get away and get loose. So you know, he always says, um, and this is his famous word about the state of black America and white people. He always says, we're not being treated as equals. 
We're only being tolerated. Y'all hear that? We're not being treated as equal. We're just merely tolerated. And um, how many how many can really argue with him? How many how many can argue with him on that fact? Because you can't. We're being tolerated. Um, and at this point, uh, that's the hardest one of the hardest pills to swallow. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to read an article, um, of course, um, from our society, which is the Black Holocaust Society. Um, uh, and I want to read a story, uh, a writing that uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett in 1900 wrote. And it was the lynch law in America. Our country's national crime is lynching. It is not the creature of an hour, the sudden outburst of an uncontrolled fury, or the unspeakable brutality of an insane mob. It represents the cool, calculating deliberation of intelligent people who openly avow that there is an unwritten law that justifies them in putting human beings to death without complaint under oath, without trial by jury, without opportunity to make defense, and without the right of appeal. The unwritten law first found an excuse with the rough, rugged, and determined man who left the civilized centers of eastern states to seek for quick returns in the gold fields of the far west. Following in uncertain pursuit of continually eluding fortune, they dared the savagery of the Indians, the hardships um, of the mountain travel and the constant terror of the border state outlaws. Naturally, they felt slight toleration for traitors in their own ranks. It was enough to fight the enemies from without. Woe to the foe within. Far removed from the entirety without protection of the courts of civilized life, these fortune seekers made laws to seek their varying emergencies. The thief who stole a horse, the bully who jumped a claim, was a common enemy. If caught, he was promptly tried, and if he was found guilty, he was hanged to a tree under which the court convened. Those were the busy days of busy men. They had no time to give a prisoner the bill of exception or stay of execution. The only way a man had to secure a stay of execution was to behave himself. Judge Lynch was original in methods, but exceedingly effective in procedure. He made the charge, impaneled the jurors, and directed the execution. When the court adjourned, the prisoner was dead. Thus, Lynch law led sway in the far west until civilization spread into the territories and the orderly processes of law took its place. The emergency no longer existing, lynching gradu gradually disappeared from the west. But the spirit of mob procedure seemed to have fastened itself into the lawlessness classes and the grim process that at first was invoked to declare justice was made to excuse, to wreak vengeance and cover the crime. Let me read that again. The emergency no longer existing, lynching gradually disappeared from the West. But the spirit of mob procedure seemed to have fastened itself upon the lawless classes and the grim procedures that at first was invoked to declare justice and was made uh, and was and was made the excuse to wreak vengeance to cover a crime. It next appeared 
in the South, where centuries of Anglo-Saxon civilization had made effective all the safeguards of court procedure. No emergency called for a lynch law. It asserted its sway in defiance of law and in favor of anarchy. There it has flourished ever since, marking the 30 years of its existence with an inhumane butchery of more than 10,000 men, women, and children by shooting, drowning, hanging, and burning them alive. Not only this, but so potent is the force of example that the lynching mania has spread throughout the North and the Middle West. It is now no uncommon thing to read of lynchings north of the Macy-Dixon line, and most of those responsible for the fashion gleefully point to these instances and assert that the north is no better than the south. This is the work of an unwritten law about which so much is said and in whose behest butchery is made the pastime and the national savagery is condoned. The first statute of this unwritten law was written in the blood of thousands of brave men who thought that a government that was good enough to create a citizenship was strong enough to protect it. Under the authority of the national law that gave every citizen the right to vote, the newly made citizens chose their, to exercise their suffrage. But the reign of the national law was short-lived and illusionary. Hardly had the sentences dried upon the uh, statute books before one southern state after another raised the cry against the Negro domination and proclaimed that there was an unwritten law that justified any means to resist it. The method then inaugurated was the outrages by the red shirt bands of Louisiana, South Carolina, and other southern states, which were succeeded by the Ku Clucks clans. These advocates of the unwritten law avowed that their purpose to intimidate, suppress, and nullify the Negro's vote. In support of his plans, the Ku Klux Klan and Red Shirt and similar organizations proceeded to beat, exile, and kill Negroes until the purpose of their organization was accomplished and the supremacy of the unwritten law was effected. Thus, lynching began in the South, rapidly spread into various states until the national law was nullified and the reign of the unwritten law was supreme. Men were taken from their homes by red shirt bands and stripped, beaten, exiled. Others were assassinated and, with their, and when their political prominence made them obnoxious to their political opponents, Huh. While the Ku Klux Klan barbarianism of election days, reveling in the butchery of thousands of colored voters, that furnished the records in congressional investigations that are a disgrace to any civilized society. It's a disgrace to civilization. The alleged menace of universal suffrage have been avoided by the absolute suppression of the Negro vote. The spirit of mob murder should have been satisfied and the butchery of Negroes should have been ceased. But men, women, and children were the victims of murder by individuals and murder by mobs, just as they had been when killed at the demands of an unwritten law to prevent Negro domination. So they can get to kill us whenever they want to if they feel our population is growing, you know, and they've been, of course, they've been deputized. We'll get to that in another story, hopefully. Negroes were killed for disputing over terms of contracts with their employers. If a few barns were burned, some colored man was killed to stop it. If a colored man resented the imposition of a white man and the two came to blows, the colored man had to die either at the hands of the white man then and there, or later at the hands of a lynch mob that speed, speedily gathered. If he showed a spirit of courageousness manhood, he was hanged for his pains, and the killings 
was justified by the declaration that he was a saucy nigga. I mean, I'm sorry, a saucy N-word. Colored women have been murdered because they refused to tell moms where the relatives could be found for lynching bees. Boys of 14 years have been lynched by white representatives of American civilization. In fact, for all kinds of offenses and for no offenses, from murders to misdemeanors, men and women are put to death without judge or jury so that although the political excuse was no longer necessary, the wholesale murder of human beings went on just the same. A new name was given to the killings, and a new excuse was invented for doing so. Again, the aid of the unwritten law is invoked, and again it comes down, it comes to the rescue. During the last 10 years, a new statute has been added to the unwritten law. This statute proclaims that for certain crimes or alleged crimes, no Negro shall be allowed a trial. That no white woman shall be compelled to charge in a, an assault under oath or submit any charge, any such charge to the investigation of a court of law. The result is that many men have been put to death whose innocence was afterward established. And today, under this reign of the unwritten law, no colored man, no matter what his reputation, is safe from the lynching if a white woman, no matter what her standing or motive, cares to charge him with, a, it, with insult or assault. It is considered a sufficient excuse and reasonable justification to put a prisoner to death under this unwritten law for the frequency, frequency repeated charge that these lynching horrors are necessary to prevent crimes against women. The sentiment of the country has been appealed to in describing the isolated conditions of white families in thickly populated Negro districts. And the charge is made that these homes are in as great danger as if they were surrounded by wild beasts. And the world has accepted this theory without let hindrance. In many cases, there has been open expression that the fate meted out to the victims was only what he deserved. In many other instances, there have been a silence that says more forcefully than words can proclaim that it is right and proper that a human being should be seized by a mob and burned to death upon the unsworn and uncooperated charge of his damn accuser. No matter that the laws presume that every man is innocent and to prove him guilty, no matter that it leaves a certain class of individuals completely at the mercy of another class, no matter that it encouraged those criminally disposed to blacken their faces and commit any crime in the calendar so as long as they can throw suspicion on some Negro. Still doing it to this day. As is frequently done and then lead a mob to take his life no matter that the mob make a farce of the land and a mockery of justice. No matter that the hundreds of boys are being hardened in crime and schooled in vice by the reputation of such scenes before their very eyes. If a white woman declares herself insulted or assaulted, Some life must pay the penalty. With all the horrors of the Spanish Inquisition and all the barbarian, barbarism of the Middle Age. 
The world looks on and it says it is well. Not only are 200 men and women put to death annually on the average in this country, but by mobs. These lives are taken with the greatest publicity. In many instances, the leading citizens aid and abet their presence when they do not participate. And the leading journalists inflame the public mind to the lynching point with scarehead articles and offer rewards. Whenever a burning is advertised to take place, the railroads run excursion. Photographs are taken. In the same jubilee indulged that has characterized the public hangings for over a hundred years. These are Ida B. Wells' words, her observation of what she considered living at the time and the lynching that was going on with us and white people. This is nothing new. This mob, this January 6th behavior Nothing new. I'll see y'all in the next video, part two.